All right, it looks like we have uh, a good number of attendees in our webinar. I uh, want to welcome everybody to uh, our 10th Decoding the Past conversation, the global stage at CGU, personal computing, and the legacies of Paul Gray. Uh, my name is Josh Good. I'm a professor of history and cultural studies here at CGU. I manage our museum studies program as well. And uh, I serve as a board member, along with uh, a few of my colleagues, uh, of the Paul Gray Personal Computing Museum. It, it's, it's kind of hard to believe and, and very exciting to call this our 10th Decoding the Past uh, series. It's amazing how we, we've done 10 already. Um, this has proven to be a very popular and exciting uh, conversation series dedicated uh, to the museum and also dedicated in some ways by default to the legacy of Paul Gray and what he did at CGU and his career, his relationship with faculty and students. Um, this speaking series, the, the Decoding the Past, is the product of two very productive partnerships um, that both trace their roots back to Paul Gray and the creation of the Paul Gray Personal Computing Museum. Um, partnerships that define, in some ways, the spirit of CGU, its interdisciplinarity, the whole idea that a center for information systems and technology can work with its colleagues in the arts and humanities, in the arts and humanities, museum studies, to build a museum, uh, to work together, and create a functioning, successful, very public outreach uh, museum that lets the CGU community both communicate with each other and also to the outside world. So that's one partnership. The other partnership uh, started about seven years ago, um, a, a new partnership to place a museum studies student, one of uh, my students, to work as the executive director of the Paul Gray Personal Computing Museum. I approached my colleague, Lauren Olfman, who you see on the screen, and we talked about creating a new position, an executive director, but a position with a lofty title for a current student who's working uh, in museum studies, to work with faculty, to work with Paul Gray's daughter, Terry Childs, who also is on the museum board. And that partnership to allow a student to serve as an executive director has, pr has proven to be an even grander success. We've had three executive director emerita, um, three students who've already now graduated and have moved on. One is a senior museum educator at uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA, in Los Angeles. She also serves as the secretary uh, of the board of directors for the Museum Educators of Southern California. The other uh, is an exhi exhibitions operations manager at the Hoover Institution Library and Archives at Stanford. The third is pursuing her PhD at CGU. Uh, and the fourth is uh, Anna Atkinson, who you see on the screen, a recent alum of the Museum Studies program who splits her time working with other museums in Los Angeles, including as the curriculum development spe specialist at the Venda Museum in Culver City. One other great benefit of this, uh, of these partnerships has been this series, the Decoding the Past series, the brainchild of Paul Gray's daughter, Terry Child. Um, using Terry's networks, our students' creativity and training, and the university's resources to foster this public speaker series. Today, we are honoring Paul Gray himself and want to discuss his legacy in lieu of a commemoration that we missed because of COVID, the 20th anniversary of the creation of the museum. But I do note, as I was doing my prep for this, that we are actually on the, we are in the 40th anniversary year of Paul's arrival at CGU. So the timing uh, is perfect for this conversation to talk about Paul Gray's legacy. So that's it. Uh, welcome everybody. I wanna turn uh, the, the mic over to my colleague and friend, Lauren Olfman, Professor Emeritus of, uh, at CGU uh, from our Center for uh, Information Systems and Technology, Lauren. Thanks, Josh. Thanks a lot. I, I've, I've enjoyed working with you over the last seven plus years, and uh, um, I'm not sure I want it to continue much longer, but fine, I'm retired. So today we're going to not have a conversation per se, as much as hear um, different perspectives from alumni, colleagues, and um, and others who are interested in the PC Museum uh, to uh, you know showcase 
some of the interesting ideas that Paul has inter introduced when uh, he was a professor of information science. So we're going to start off uh, talking a little bit about the uh, museum itself. Uh, we're going to see both sound bites, which are um, recorded audio from a number of individuals, and we're going to um, hear some live presentations as well. So um, I am going to turn over the um, uh, proceedings to Terry Childs, and, um, and we'll move on from there. Thank you, Lauren. So I'd like to begin by thanking everyone for attending this event today. I can tell you that dad would be delighted to see all of you here. The purpose of the museum. Um, my father took to PCs like a duck to water. From yeah. the beginning, he understood the importance of personal computing on people's lives, and he envisioned both the technological and the societal aspects of PCs. I think he really felt privileged to live through the time when computers went from being for a select few in air conditioned rooms to becoming available to everybody. And his desire to preserve personal computing led him to start a collection of PCs. Now, when my father decided to retire from CGU, he and my mother were moving to a smaller home. Dad wanted a place to keep the computers that he'd collected over time. He told he told Lauren about the collection, and Lauren surprised Dad by organizing financial donations for the museum and naming it after him. Dad was thrilled by this announcement at his retirement party, and he decided to curate the museum himself. My father knew that in a fast-moving field, things change. People move more slowly than technology, and he wanted to preserve a moment in time. How do you think Paul Gray's research, mentoring, or service contributions to information systems is reflected in the Paul Gray Personal Computing Museum? Paul was there in the beginning of the PC revolution. He had a Xerox star in his office that had the original graphical user interface. He loved the big screen and the mouse. Apple came out with the Mac, which copied that Xerox design. Paul started researching group decision support systems with PCs and Unix PCs. While PCs were gaining acceptance, we were networking them and experimenting with what later became known as groupware. Paul encouraged the graduate students to experiment with PCs, databases, local area networks, and especially with group decision support systems. One research question involved whether being anonymous on a computer might enable better participation and therefore better decision making. Paul had put together an innovative program in information systems that focused on producing graduates that could bridge the gap between programmers and business executives at a time when that concept was new. At that time, it was unclear which, if any of these personal computers would become the most popular or even if PCs would, would catch on. Paul's museum showcases those early devices, how they evolved, became smaller, changed shape, changed color, became portable, provided new storage and memory options, got network, and eventually evolved into tablets, smartphones, watches, and amazingly powerful devices that almost no business or person lives without. Remote work is normal. The PC has changed everything. Paul Gray's museum tells that history. Uh, I just wanted to jump in. That was Bill Schutz. Bill's a PhD alum from uh, uh, the years he would call was his uh, mentor. And he was here in the early years of the program. And he's now the chief information officer at Snow College. Uh, I also wanted to mention that you can provide comments in the chat throughout the presentations. And uh, Anna will read some of these comments near the end of the session. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Terry. Thanks, Lauren. So I'm going to share a little bit more about Paul Gray, the person. I know that many of you know that uh, my father was an inspiration, and he was certainly an inspiration to me. His early life wasn't easy. He came to this country at age eight because of Hitler and it was life-changing, but he overcame adversity with a strong belief in himself and those he loved. During my childhood, 
dad went back to school many times, first for additional degrees, and then realizing that the classroom was where he truly belonged as a professor. Now, two things about my father's character. He always had a strong belief in himself, and he had an incredible amount of enthusiasm for everything he did. And that enthusiasm was infectious. He had a terrific sense of humor. Both he and my mom made lots of puns, both good and bad. <laughs> My father was very much an intellectual, and he relished that spark in others. Broad thinking was the norm, and the life of the mind was always highly valued. Dad was an engineer in the optimistic American tradition of the 1950s and 60s. American technology was world class. There was a solid, inherent belief in modern technology in the future. We'd watch every space launch and carefully followed each achievement in the space program. Now, bear in mind that I was dad's first student, and he was a brilliant teacher. In addition to academics, there was also his love of sports, modern art, theater, and classical music. I really thought that all children were taken to college football games, to the theater and concerts, and to art museums. At our nightly dinner table, we'd share the events of the day, through which he taught me the value of hard work, the importance of being an informed citizen, caring about democracy, and giving back to the community. At SRI in Menlo Park in the 1960s, Dad worked with many influential pioneers in the computer and technology industries. One of these was Doug Engelbart, who believed that computing could change the world by extending the power of the human mind. Engelbart also invented the mouse, which was an awkward wooden box with two large wheels. Dad told the story that Engelbart called several people in to see this new as yet unnamed invention, which moved a dot on the screen when the wooden box was moved. They all said, Doug, that's great. What could possibly be the application for that? So in reviewing the tribute to dad upon his retirement from CGU, I was struck by how many doctoral students commented on their lives growing, changing and being enriched by having worked with him. One of them quoted a verse from the Sanskrit Vedic literature, the gift of knowledge is the greatest gift. I feel both lucky and honored to have had Paul Gray as my father. The lessons he taught me in life and scholarship are with me always. Well, it's wonderful, Terry. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, and now I am going to ask President Lynn Jessup to uh, make some comments about his uh, um, connection with Paul and Paul's mentorship. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks everyone. It's good, good to be here today. And Josh, I like your branded mug that you're holding up from time to time. Good job. <laughs> and Omar, it's great to see you. I haven't seen you for a while. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny the connections for me because it this takes me back to being a doctoral student at the University of Arizona, I was there from 85 to 89, if I'm remembering the calendar right. And <clears throat> I got there at a time when PCs were not quite ubiquitous, but pretty common at that point. The internet, as we know it today, didn't exist. There was a sort of a precursor version, BitNet, that was being used by some faculty researchers in certain disciplines, but that was about it. Um, and being able to do things and share files across campuses. That was, that, there was no electronic commerce as we know it today, no internet as we know it today. And in fact, the local area networks were relatively new. So I got to Arizona during that 85 to 89 time frame, And of course, then I see what Jay Nunnemaker is doing in the lab with network PCs, which I was seeing for the first time myself. And there were you know, these hordes of doctoral students writing code to quickly try to stand up software that would enable people to interact with each other in, in the room across PCs on a local area network. That was relatively new and it blew me away. So then I, I learned that IBM had given out a number of these huge grants at the time of a million or $2 million to just a very select set of schools to start to explore these topics. And that's how I learned about Minnesota and the other programs around the country. And they were generally, I would say, Lauren, almost all big private R1s or AAUs, except for one, <laughs> to my memory. And that was Claremont and that was Paul. And I remember thinking to myself, I got to meet this Paul guy because I'm a California native. Like, how the heck did this little private school get one of these grants? 
how did that happen? And then I went to a conference as a doctoral student in that time frame, and that's where I first met Paul. And Terry, I, I think I got a little bit of your experience as daughter, because that's my my memory of Paul was that I really felt like he was mentor more sort of, you know, mentor slash father figure, not so much the mm -hmm. mentorship I was getting from my faculty at Arizona. There was nothing wrong with my experience at Arizona, but there was a lot of hard driving faculty and hard pushing doctoral students. And I was wanting to explore some topics in my dissertation using the groupware or group decision support systems that were being developed that was a little you know, out of the ordinary. It was not in vogue yet at the time because I was learning organizational behavior, psych, social psych, lab experiments, experimental psychology, and then applying that to the design science that was going on over in MIS. They were just building stuff and didn't stop too much to think about whether this feature or that feature like anonymity made sense. So I was a bit of a fish out of water. And I remember being at a conference and then approaching your dad because I kind of then had knew more about him. And I just, he was so supportive and so caring and compassionate and open and that, no, you're fine, do what you're doing. This is a, this is a good thing for you to do. This topic is valid. Your research is okay. You're okay. You know, I felt like I was getting at a personal level the validation that I needed at the time to take the steps I was about to take. I don't know that I would have taken them if I, I hadn't had the influence of your dad. Uh, and then that started a whole wave of, I don't know that I started it, but a whole wave of, of experimental psychology then ripped through what had been design science up till that point. I felt like I got to at least be in on the front end of it, encouraged by your dad. Again, I don't know that I would have done it without his, his prompting. So for me, I'm sorry that I got here too late. So I missed him by about six years here, but gosh, it would have been just such poetic justice, you know, for him to know that I ended up back here. Um, and, and I really, you know, I'm, my start was encouraged by him. Uh, so it's very fitting for me to be here today at CGU. And, and to be here today sharing this with you all. Great, thanks, Lynn. That's, uh, I know how much you uh, you really felt um, um, connected to Paul and, you know, uh, that comes through in the way you talk about him. Uh, I'm gonna say a few words. I hope I don't take too long to do this, but uh, you, you, when Terry was speaking, you probably realized that she was an only child. And um, when I interviewed he, at CGU in 1980, when was it, seven, um, Paul uh, took me to his house with um, his wife, Muriel, and uh, we were having dinner. And he said, you know, I have a daughter, and of course I love her, but if you came here, I'd treat you like my, like you were my son. And, you know, and I was kind of taken aback by that. But I tell you, he did that. He, he did things like I, when I, after a couple of years here, I decided to buy a little motorbike, a 150 cc motorbike to commute back and forth to the office. And he said, please don't, it's too dangerous. Do not buy a motorcycle <laughs> and Muriel. Uh, you know, Terry's mother, yes. And they really, they they lobbied me, lobbied me. And I said, well, my Darlene, my wife, she would, you know, she thinks it's going to be okay. So I'm going to go against your advice. But that's the kind of uh, sort of loving. And then all the way down to one day I got into work and Paul came to my office and he said, do you know that you didn't close your door, your office door last night? And, you know, don't ever do that again. <laughs> what it was is there was a, one of those, uh, you know, the little rubber things that keeps the door open. And I thought I'd kicked it out and I hadn't. I didn't argue with him. And then, you know, another thing was he always talked about know the top 100 people in your field. And um, three months into my academic career, he came to me and he said, I need you to substitute for me at the Hawaii International Conference on System Sciences. And probably half or 10 of the top 100 people were in meetings that I was substituting for. So very trusting man. And, uh, and then he also guided me through something that all academics 
learn is that academic life is political. And uh, I had talked to him, criticized a little bit the school administration. And Paul said, no, you need to go to the to David Drew. He's the chair of the faculty. He'll advise you. Don't do anything um, that you'll regret later. And then finally, you know, he had his his simple, highly effective concepts that just I I always come back to them. The theory of n plus two, the idea that academics is as academic departments and and schools are a zero sum game, and his uh, his concern about certain conferences. Three day. This is a three day conference in a one day town. He used to say. So uh, with that. I am going to, uh, we're going to listen to one of Paul's students. He was, I, I would chair his doctoral dissertation, Munir Monviwala, but the dissertation was really um, focused on the group decision support um, um, lab that Paul had established at CGU. So let's hear from Munir. What is one important way that Paul Gray impacted your career or research? Since choice is one, I think the most important is uh, that he enabled, demonstrated, pushed me to think outside the box. And that stuck with me for a, for a very long time. And the way that has instantiated is to you know, not just do the mainstream research, but to look for new kinds of research, new topics, or we used to call the first paper. So the, the Paul Gray Museum has one important computer in it, which is Xerox Park. And I remember Paul Gray showing me the Xerox Park, and that's when it all became clear to me about the history and future of computing, how one invention could have such a humongous uh, impact on, on on humanity, not just uh, not just business. So thanks, Moot. Uh, oh, I don't know if Munir's here or not, but. I thank him and every Bill and everyone else for making these audio uh, sound bites. And I also want to mention that uh, Munir is a professor at Temple University, professor of MIS, and the Stouffer Senior Research Fellow in the Fox School of Business. And now I'm going to turn this over to David Drew. Uh, David is CGU Professor of Education, Joseph B. Platt Chair in the Management of Technology. So. Uh, David's going to talk about Paul, the author, and other things, I assume. Take it away. Thank you, Lauren. I'll, I'll begin with just one or two other things that connect to what's been said already. Um, Paul, uh, Terry, correct me if I'm wrong, but as part of his biography, it's worth mentioning that uh, Paul was uh, so capable that he, he entered college at the age of 16. Mm -hmm. um, he, um, he had such creative energy. And uh, one indication of that, I remember at his memorial service that Betty Hagelbarger made the point that whenever she, sh saw, whenever she saw Paul, he was walking fast. He mm -hmm. had places to go, things to do. Uh, the energy just burst out of him. Um, Paul was a polymath, a Renaissance man. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a technical expert. He he knew computing. Uh, he he knew operations research, uh, what we'd now call data science. But he also, and this is what I'll focus on in telling, uh, uh, talking about our collaboration. Uh, he also was an editor, and uh, uh, very much caught up with the use of the English language. Uh, he. Uh, he had worked full time as an editor in his younger days, and um, he he was always an expert at and very concerned about the most effective way to communicate a concept. Um, over the years, um, I've published various books and articles by myself and a roughly equal number where I've collaborated with other people. By far, the best collaboration I ever had was with Paul Gray. I mean, we just connected in the writing process. Um, 
and we had very sim similar professional backgrounds, um, uh, including I've worked as an editor, but uh, it was it was always an extremely pleasant collaboration. Um, we typically would meet um, either as we were writing a, a book. I'm, I'm talking about our collaboration in a book which has now gone through two editions. Um, this is the book. It's a practical guide to how to succeed in higher education. And I would like to take uh, just a minute to tell you about the history, but I'll say that the period of most intense writing was when he was uh, retired, living in Irvine. Uh, we would meet sometimes at his condo, sometimes at uh, Waters Restaurant, sometimes at Scott's Restaurant. And this, uh, it very briefly, is the history of this book, because it, originally we had no idea that we were going to write a book together. I had lunch with Paul shortly after he arrived. This would have been 1983 or 84 in a Chinese restaurant on Foothill Boulevard. What have you been doing lately? He said, I gave a speech uh, just last week uh, to some new faculty mm -hmm. at an international conference, and I provided them with some guidance on how to build an academic career. I said, that's a coincidence. I've just completed a chapter where half the chapter I devoted to guidance to academic scientists, faculty, on how to build an academic career. We decided to put that information into a little memo. I think it was 15 hints about an academic career. And over the years, we would just occasionally add a hint or two. And at a certain point, many years later, we decided maybe this could be expanded into a book. A publisher was interested. Uh, we published the book in 2008. We published a second edition three years later. Uh, it, it has sold very well, over 15,000 copies. Um, and I did a, little, a few quick calculations uh, this morning. Um, the first edition, which came out in 2008, uh, was 145 pages. 15 of those were just more or less blank chapter titles. Leaves 130 written pages, if you will. Um, it basically works out for each of us to two and a half pages a year. So this was a long process that, re uh, that resulted in a, a very happy collaboration um, I miss Paul. We are planning a third edition. His name will be on the cover. Terry, I'm going to talk with you about that. And um, he, he was such a creative person and a good friend. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to contribute today. Thank you so much, David. That's um, I know how heartfelt that is. Um, uh, let's see. Now uh, I want to bring in uh, Omar El Sawi, Professor Omar El Sawi. He's the USC Kenneth King Stonier, or maybe Stonier, Professor of Business Administration and Professor of Data Sciences and Operations. So go right ahead, Omar. Thank you very much, Sir Lorne. I'm uh, really happy to be here, and uh, uh, Paul Gray was uh, very special to me. Uh, let me start by just echoing what uh, Terry uh, said, that his enthusiasm and his energy and his sense of humor were infectious. And, uh, you know, he'd get an idea and his, his eyes would uh, light up, uh, and that was really nice. He also, and I guess uh, it's, it says that I'm supposed to talk about him as a global thinker, so I'll mention that a little bit. Uh, he, uh, first of all, he would interact with people from different nationalities, different ethnicities, junior, senior, student, faculty, all with the same amount of enthusiasm and care and empathy. And, and that was uh, something I learned from him and, and very uh, admirable. Um, 
and uh, certainly he also was global in the sense, like Munir mentioned, of thinking outside the box. But uh, let me be more uh, personal here. So uh, Paul adopted me in uh, 1981. Uh, I was giving a talk as a PhD student uh, at the Decision Support Systems Conference, DSS 81 at the time. And it was my very first talk that I ever gave at the conference. And, uh, you know, to overcome my uh, nervousness, I tried to say jokes and nobody laughed. <laughs> and I remember I was uh, trying to push the idea that, uh, you, you know, you needed more than uh, decision making, you needed uh, scanning uh, as well. And uh, I likened it to uh, a Russian psychologist who uh, talked about hydrogen and oxygen and said, look, uh, hydrogen burns and oxygen uh, supports uh, combustion, but you put them together and you get water. And uh, anyway, he came after the talk and kind of picked me up and uh, uh, said, oh, it was fine. And, and uh, I'm also a Stanford graduate. And uh, so we developed that uh, bond and uh, it continued for uh, many, many years and we've co-authored and collaborated and I've <laughs> refereed for him and co-edited and did all kinds of things. I also want to point out to what he did with communications of the CACM that was uh, mentioned also and uh, and how he thought of it as giving back to the community and finding an outlet where different types of articles could be published. And it continues uh, strong today and, and that has helped the field and helped many people. And he brought on Steve Alter, who I think is here today as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's really an admirable thing to do and, and very uh, inspiring. Uh, I also had a lot of fun with, with Paul uh, in, uh, we would uh, take part in the Society for Information Management uh, CIO uh, meetings in uh, Southern California. And, uh, you know, he would spot a, a company that was doing something interesting. And so he had a very good sense of practice and I liked practice too. And so we would enter these competitions together and, uh, you know, highlight some new innovations in uh, companies. And we did that a number of times with Western Digital and with IndyMac Bank. And I think the CIO, Eric Krog, who's a C uh, CGU graduate is, is uh, today at the webinar. And then finally, I think we did one on, on, uh, Kaiser Permanente, and unfortunately, he passed away while we were doing that, and we pu uh, published it uh, posthumously uh, in in his honor. But all throughout this, he's always been so enthusiastic, so inspiring, and so caring, and I miss him very much uh, to this day. Thank you, Omar. Yeah, I I know that you miss him a lot. So we all do. Um, okay, I'm just piggybacking on to your um, presentation, talking about design research. Uh, I think it was 1992, Paul came by my office and said, you know, I read this, this article um, and it's just, we, it should be published immediately. And it was your, you were co-author on that article about design research. And, uh, you know, that was the kind of vision he had that, you know, and, and, and uh, also his editing of the uh, communications was focused on getting things out there and having them, you know, um, apply to, to both academic and practice uh, sides of the coin. So, yeah, you, you were, uh, important, uh, an important um, part of that, and Paul helped get that message out. Um, well, actually, that uh, particular one, actually, was uh, uh, we had submitted it as an NSF proposal. Oh, 
<laughs> and it was next and they said yeah you know what is this you know something like that so we turned around and we changed it into an uh, article for information systems research and i guess uh, paul gray was wise enough to give it to more senior uh, reviewers who yeah. had the vision to to look ahead and uh, it's now a highly cited article actually even though for the first uh, 10 years it did not have uh, many citations actually yeah I can say it's my favorite article that I except for the ones I wrote <laughs> uh, let, let's uh, move on to Paul's uh, research um, his innovative research we've talked quite a bit about group decision making um, but also a really important uh, part of his research had to do with telecommuting. Uh, and we're going to hear from Jack Nillis, retired USC professor and internationally known as the father of telecommuting to tell a little bit more about that, that uh, relationship. What is one important way that Paul Gray impacted your career or research? In 1973, I had uh, just come to the University of Southern California as its first and possibly only director of interdisciplinary research. And I was intent on starting a research program looking at the interrelation between telecommunications and transportation. And, and my focus was trying to get commuter transportation down by getting the workers to work at home. So. I looked around and found in the business school a guy named Paul Gray. He instantly caught on to what I was trying to do and helped me find a, a company to work with to, to test this all out with. Got a uh, graduate student, uh, Dave Lopez, to help me out, help throughout the entire project, get good advice and, and help make it a success. Uh, thanks, Jack. And. Um... One of the one of Paul's doctoral students, Ruth Guthrie, uh, was also involved in the lab, the group decision making, and uh, she had some great things to say about Paul as well. Oh, I do want to mention Jack uh, was um, the first decoding the past uh, presenter, as far as I remember. Somebody can correct me if I'm mistaken there, but let's hear from Ruth. What is one important way that Paul Gray impacted your career or research? The one thing I would say Paul did that impacted me to this day is sharing his curious mind and excitement for all things technology. This went far beyond how things worked. Paul was very forward thinking and could see the future a little bit, making us understand why we cared about an innovation and what the promise and maybe the fallout might be from it. He used to tell us about Minitel, a precursor to the World Wide Web, and lessons learned for the future of the internet. He was so right. Paul was also an advocate for using technology as a means to really understand it. During my time at CGU in the mid 80s, we had a group decision support lab that we used for experimenting with group decision making. We would work on connected PCs to anonymously problem solve by a text instead of speaking. We used to joke that we were entering the cone of silence. It was a great time and it let us experience what we knew about groupthink, anonymity, and power, and quality of decision making before we studied it or wrote about it. Paul taught me a never-ending love of technology and a thoughtful approach to thinking about its impact. That is something I give my students every day. Like Paul, if someone comes to ask me about something, they invariably leave with one more thing to implement and two more things to think about. Thank you, Ruth. Ruth. Uh professor at CSU, Cal State University, Pomona, uh, yeah, no, technical, polytechnic, Pomona, and uh, pardon me, and uh, yes, she's, uh, was Paul's PhD student, as I mentioned. Uh, now we're going to move on to Paul's service to the University, Claremont Graduate School, and then Claremont Graduate University. Uh, we have uh, three um, sound bites that we're going to listen to. Um, and I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, what Paul did when he, he was, he had been at uh, Southern Methodist University for a few years. And um, 
and he um, had a decision lab there way earlier than most people were thinking about this, uh, decision support systems. And, uh, and when he decided to uh, take the job as the founding chair of the information science program at CGU, he brought his ideas, of course, to Claremont. And um, he built two rooms, two decision rooms um, at, at the time in, in SMU, and he did the same at CGU. And um, he, had, he had the foresight to realize that it was worth um, studying how people behave in, in these uh, in decision rooms and what they could accomplish. We've heard quite a bit of that. So um, Paul also, um, after leaving CGU to retire, he kept teaching part-time at US, UC Irvine and wrote papers. We've heard about that. He went to conferences. Um, he was involved and he, he had uh, an involvement with data warehousing and AI projects. Um, so, I mean, he was an amazing person and he also was a collaborator. And one of the uh, important things that he did was to um, apply for the IBM uh, grant program. It was a program to start PhD programs at in business schools at uh, up to 12 universities. Uh, CGU, or CGS was the, so it was, it was awarded at the university level, but cis, uh, information science really got the resources. And Paul used those resources to do all manners of things that were interesting in his, in the various research areas that he he innovated. Um, he also got funding from HP uh, and other sources to even make greater uh, uh, value in the decision lab. And he and Zev Newman started uh, the Tel Aviv Connection, which was a, a sort of a sharing, sh one-way sharing where Tel Aviv uh, faculty at, at the business school there would come and teach for a semester or a year in the information science program. So, um, so now let's uh, listen to um, uh, a description by Jen, Jay Nunnemaker that will uh, talk more about the IBM award. Jay is the University of Arizona Regents Professor of MIS A and uh, the Saul Waddell Chair in Management Information Systems. I didn't make any big decisions without bouncing them off of Paul. And we both were recipients of uh, an IBM grant. And again, it was another reason to collaborate and get our story straight when we were talking to IBM. Thanks, Jay. And um, now we're going to hear from Niv Aitu, the uh, Tel Aviv University Collar School of Management Emeritus Professor, Vice President and Dean. Uh, let's hear what Niv has to say. What is one important way that Paul Gray impacted your career or research? Well, my first sabbatical in Claremont was in 1984, five years after the completion of my doctoral studies. My background in mathematics and information economics led me to focus my research on quantitative models deliberating in how to assess the value of information. Some colleagues told me that in order to advance my career, I should switch to a more behavioral and organizational area of information systems. I consulted with Paul, and he said that I should pursue the areas of my focus, that is, namely, continue along the track of information economics. Moreover, he suggested that I will offer a course in information economics to master and doctoral students in the program. So I did. 
The course was a great success and my research was later on appreciated among our colleagues. This can be learned by the number of applications and citations. Thank you, Niv. Uh, I should also mention, I mentioned Zeb Newman earlier, but I, uh, Zeb was Niv's uh, um, dissertation advisor and also uh, a dean at, um, at Tel Aviv University and the, you know, sort of the, the, in, uh, the, the linchpin between um, making the Tel Aviv uh, faculty happy in Claremont and, you know, Paul was able to do uh, the kinds of things that you've described. Unfortunately, Zev passed away earlier this year. Um, and now we're going to hear from an, another uh, important uh, link in the chain. This is uh, Chuck Morrissey. Chuck is a Pepperdine Emeritus Professor of Information Systems Technology Management. He did his executive PhD in the Drucker School under uh, the supervision of Paul. And he was one of the early um, facilitators of e-learning. So um, Josh is going to read um, Chuck's statement. Or not, or am I going to? <laughs> Uh, 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 I don't have, I, I didn't know I was reading the thing. Um, it's fine. Do you I have it? Actually, I have it. Um, I can grab it just one second. Um, sorry about sorry. that. No, uh, that's my fault. I have it in a folder right here. Awesome. Okay. So I'll read Chuck's statement out. Um, as a doctoral student and research assistant of Paul's starting in the early 90s, I had the good fortune to support his vision for the development and implementation of the museum in 2000. This initiative was consistent with the Claremont College's history of development of museums in a number of disciplines. More importantly, Paul's recognition of the internet industry's growth, providing anytime, anywhere data communications was rapidly leading to a need for education to understand the artificial intelligence movement. This movement's impact on curriculum would also recognize his pioneering work in the need for groupware curriculum education as the reality of digital transformation in college curriculum to prepare graduates for this new industry, such as limited residency models. The museum also became a shared resource for the entire higher education industry, as they had to rapidly redesign their own disciplines with assignments in this new area. Most importantly, Paul never lost sight of his obligation to guide the doctor doctorate process for his students and the opportunity they had to speak at national and regional education conferences. Great, great job, Emma. Thank you so much. And thanks, Chuck, for, for writing that uh, about your, your connection with Paul. Uh, now we're going to talk uh, briefly about Paul's service to the field of uh, information systems and uh, summarize some key awards that he received from his uh, colleagues and, and uh, as a result of his incredible service. And um, we're also going to hear a soundbite from Jane Nunnemaker. I just wanted to uh, mention that Paul wrote over 150 journal articles and authored or edited and or edited 14 academic books. We heard about one of them uh, from, um, from David. Uh, he wrote a book on the uh, IFPS, which is a, a sort of a precursor to uh, the Excel model of spreadsheets. It was actually a really amazing and useful product that kind of got swept under the, the uh, Excel um, glacier. But uh, it turned out that I actually uh, had taught IFPS when I was a doctoral student. Maybe that helped me um, in the good graces of Paul. And uh, I also mentioned that he did some work on data warehousing. Uh, he founded, and we heard from Omar that he founded uh, the Communications of the Association for Information Systems. And um, okay, he was president of the Omega Rho from 
1988 to 1990. That's an operations research um, uh, academic association. He was president of the Institute for Management Sciences uh, from uh, 92 to 93, and at that time supported a merger between the Operations Research Society of America and the Institute for Management Science to uh, become INFORMS. So Paul, you know, didn't, oh, I'm a Tim's person and I can never share the, the mantle with the operations research people. Well, that went when he was president of both of those uh, entities. In 1992, he helped found the Association for Information Systems by inviting a good portion of the top 100 IS academics to an organizational media, media, meeting, pardon me, at the International Conference on Information Systems. Uh, Paul was named Educator of the Year by the Association of Information Technology Professionals. He was a fellow of the Institute for Operation, of Operations Research and Management Science. He received the, Paul, the George E. Kimball Medal from that organization. He was an AIS fellow and an AIS Leo Award winner. And uh, now we'll hear from uh, Jay Nina Maker about that last item. Do you have any personal stories or outside of work stories that you would like to talk about with you and Paul? I guess the big story is there's in the information systems area, they give an award, it's called the Leo Award for the first computers. And I've always thought it strange. They usually give one per year and they gave it to Paul and myself because I think they couldn't decide on the committee which one to give it to. And so we had a good time in Barcelona, Spain, celebrating that decision. And so our last couple of slides in the slideshow are actually um, a selection of just a few of the books that Paul authored, and then also a few of his awards. Um, and I'll stop the share for now um, so that Terry can talk, um, but I will put this back up during you know the time for sharing experiences um all right thank you anna so just very briefly um we all know that my father touched many people and he left the world a better place and we'd love to hear from you folks um, about the experiences that you have and your thoughts that you have about paul gray So I'm going to have this up and I'm going to go ahead and um, just go through the chat and read out some things that people have said. Um, there's a lot of people have shared. If I don't get to yours, um, I am going to be collecting a record of the chat and um, compiling something for our museum blog. Um, so we will share your thoughts. Um, so from Donna Schaefer, um, as a professor and dissertation chair, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think, what would Paul Gray say about this? Um, from Stephen Alter, Paul was my department head when I was at USC. Later, he asked me to be a senior editor when he started CAIS. I produced a bunch of early papers that he encouraged greatly and that eventually proved quite useful for my subsequent work. Uh, just a month ago, I mentioned what Paul Gray would have said when I was asked to write something about what CAIS continues trying to contribute. Um, from Jack Nellis, um, I haven't emphasized it enough, but it's quite possible that our research on telecommuting might never have passed a theoretical stage without Paul. Paul helped organize the crucial part of the project, getting a real company to participate in it. In it. Uh, again, from Donna Schaefer, um, Paul's example is outstanding and much harder to emulate than one might think. Um, oh, this is from Patrick Olson. <laughs> I just Donna commented it. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, so Stephen uh, Alter also, again, commented, um, 
The comments about telecommuting by uh, Jack Nellis remind me of something that Paul said to me. Something like, I am doing research about telecommuting and tomorrow I need to fly across the country to New, ha New Hampshire to give a presentation about telecommuting. How ridiculous is that? Um, oh, that's a good, <laughs> right? You have to present about telecommuting in person. <laughs> and uh, from Ruth, I used to ask Paul, how was your flight? He would always reply that the flight was great. He spent the entire time on the laptop finishing a paper. A remarkably productive person. Um, thank all of, all of you for sharing. Um, I'm going to check the Q&A really quick to see if there's anything in there. Um, okay. Ooh, more in the chat. Um, thank you. Um, from Eric Crow. I was fortunate enough to work with Paul and Omar on the 2005 AIS SIM best paper, ultimately published in MISQE. Paul was so encouraging and, along with Omar, a key factor of applying to the CGU PhD program to pivot from practice to academia. Um, so we have about three minutes left. Um, so I am going to go ahead and stop the share just so we can do a wrap up um, from Terry and Josh. Thanks again, Anna. And thank you all for your wonderful comments um, and feel free to continue to share. It's, it's truly heartwarming uh, to hear how uh, my dad really made a difference in people's lives and have continued to do so today. That's the thing that we can see. Um, he was um, truly somebody who loved education and the PC Museum is the opportunity to extend that education for posterity. So keep that in mind. Uh, we do operate um, with a budget that is always in need of support. And before I go further into that, I will pass it on to Josh, who will take that idea even further. But thank you all for attending. Josh. Thanks, Terry. Yeah, I just let me add my voice of thanks to everyone who participated and all those in the audience in the chat. Um, you know, it's it is a responsibility that we all of us, Lauren, Terry, Anna, um, Allison, Kira, uh, uh, Bailey, all of our all of the people who form the board of the Paul Gray Personal Computing Museum. We recognize that we are it's a responsibility and an awesome one to be stewards of Paul Gray's legacy and we take it seriously and we really value it. And we do that by looking to the future. We've been doing all sorts of innovative programming or trying to do innovative programming through the museum, new kinds of uh, school curriculum, um, timelines all on the website. Take a look at the website when you have a chance to, to see what we're doing. and. We have plenty and plenty and plenty of plans for doing new and interesting things. I don't know if any of you know this, but the computing world changes and is always changing. And so we are trying to stay ahead of it and, and recognize that as a, as a museum dedicated to personal computing, we want to be at the forefront of what a museum can do to both chart the past, but also to think about the future. That requires support and it really, uh, we always are in need of support. So I put into the chat um, a link to uh, a, a donation page that will allow you to send any donation that goes directly to the museum uh, and allows us to uh, offer as a paid internship, a salary to the executive director, to a student um, that allows us to think about uh, and create new programming, including the decoding the past, including the sound bites that you, you've been seeing. We've been really proud of the work that we've done. We're, we know it's part of an important uh, legacy, and we also know that that legacy is about going deep, deeper and deeper into the future. And so we, we need your support, we need your help, and uh, we appreciate anything you can offer. Back to you, Terry. Okay. Um, so thank you, Josh, and thanks everybody. Um, if there's anybody else that has a final word or two they'd like to say, speak up now. Uh, otherwise, we do appreciate your time. We understand that you also have other things that you need to get done today. Um, and we're all connected because of Paul Gray. Thank you.